Hello everyone, and welcome to the History of Byzantium, Episode 22, Justinian's Legacy. Imperial majesty should not only be graced with arms, but armed with laws, so that good government may prevail in time of war and peace alike. The head of the Roman state can then stand victorious, not only over enemies in war, but also over troublemakers, driving out their wickedness through the paths of the law, and can triumph as much by his devotions to the law as for his conquests in battle. Long hours of work and careful planning have, with God's help, given us success in both these fields. Barbarian nations brought beneath our yoke know the scale of our exertions in war. Africa and countless other provinces restored to Roman jurisdiction and brought back within our empire after so long an interval bear witness to the victories granted to us by the will of heaven. However, it is laws that we have already managed to enact and collect that all our peoples are ruled. So said Justinian in the preface to The Institutes, a handbook for law students issued in 533. It's a clear statement of the emperor's belief in the importance of the law in regulating the lives of his people, while also showing us his pride in retaking Africa and one of the ways he used that conquest to boost his own image as a great and worthy emperor. Last time, we saw Africa fall to Belisarius and the Vandals swept away. Back in Constantinople, Justinian must have been ecstatic. He had emerged unscathed from the Nika revolt, and now his plan to restore the Roman Empire seemed to have been given divine approval. The emperor pushed on, his reforming zeal unleashed on the world. It might seem odd to name an episode Justinian's legacy when we're not even close to halfway through his reign. However, two of his achievements stand above all others for their lasting impact. Today, we examine them both. We begin with the law. You'll recall that in 529, the Code of Justinian had been published. The revised and edited collection brought together all existing Roman laws into one set of books. An immense accomplishment in itself, but it was only the beginning. The Quaestor Tribonian was then appointed chairman of a second law commission, who began work soon after, and were in the middle of their labours when the Nika revolt broke out. Fortunately for them, their endeavours were not reduced to ashes, and by 533 they were able to publish two more important legal works. The Digest was an anthology of legal commentaries, while the Institutes were an official textbook for law students. These might sound like more humdrum administrative reforms, but their story is far more significant than that. Roman law developed in two forms, statutes written by legislators and precedents decided by judges. The legislators were initially the Senate of Republican Rome, and then, of course, the emperors. The statutes, edicts, and laws had all been gathered up into the Code of Justinian. However, the precedents, as decided by judges in individual cases and lawsuits, were far harder to gather, as of course there were so many of them. We might tend to think about criminal cases when we think of the law. Publius stole a loaf of bread, theft is against the law, so Publius is guilty and should be punished. However, in practice, those cases are rarer than, say, Publius's will is contested, or Publius's prized apple tree fell into his neighbor's garden and the damage has to be paid for, or Publius is refusing to honor a contract because he claims the terms have been rendered null and void. In lawsuit Crazy Rome, thousands upon thousands of cases had been brought before the urban praetor, who would then have to write the complaints up into a form that would allow them to be easily understood by whoever was judging the case. 
be it an actual magistrate, a jury, or some other mutually agreeable citizen. The sheer amount of legal decisions and opinion became too large for one person to remember. By the dying days of the Republic, a lawyer like Cicero could make a fortune by constructing sophisticated arguments based on legal precedents. During the early imperial centuries, several prominent jurists had attempted to summarize whole bodies of legal opinion into a digestible form. By Justinian's day, the four jurists whose work dominated this field were Julian, Papinian, Gaius, and Ulpian. A quote from Ulpian helps demonstrate their collective skill at summarizing complex ideas, with the phrase, The commandments of the law are these, live honorably, harm nobody, and give everyone his due. Tribonian's Law Commission were given the gargantuan task of summarizing the work of these four jurists and others from over 2,000 books of legal advice into a practical written form. As chief legal minister, Tribonian would also need to make judgments about the decisions of the past as the jurists did not always agree, and then to bring them into line with Christian principles and the mood of Justinian's administration. The commission was made up of six law professors and eleven lawyers, and amazingly they only needed three years to complete the task. And the commissioners were not allowed to devote their lives entirely to the digest. Many of them were still working for the Praetorian prefect and were needed to help settle existing cases. When completed, the digest ran to more than 800,000 words in 50 books. It's worth noting that Tribonian committed fraud in order to create the digest. It was important to Justinian that he be seen to be restoring the Roman past and acting upon the authority of established judicial precedent. So to make the law say what Justinian would want it to say, Tribonian needed to make the great jurists of the past agree. In a case where Ulpian disagreed with Julian on something, Tribonian would simply rewrite what one of them had said. The result was a far more efficient digest, with all inconsistencies eliminated, but it was not an accurate reflection of the convoluted past. The digest was swiftly followed by the institutes, which would provide guidance for law students on how to learn and interpret the law. The following year, 534, saw a revised and corrected version of the Code of Justinian with all the laws of the past five years included. Together, they formed the Corpus Juris Civilis, or the Code of Civil Law. They were intended to be the sole source of law, with no reference needed to the works of the past. No more would a canny lawyer unearth some obscure ruling which supported his case. All the answers were in the Code. The completion of the whole code in less than 10 years has been called one of the most brilliant feats of organization in the history of civil administration. It's clear that Tribonian was a man of rare talent, who had matched the depth of ambition of his master in bringing his project to a successful conclusion. He was to remain Justinian's quaestor until his death in the next decade. The laws show us the continued Christianization of the empire, as many words are spent on the organization of clerical and monastic life. This included important protections for church property, which was never to be sold, and encouraged the serfdom of those who worked its lands. Bishops were encouraged to help run their local towns and enforce laws against gambling and other local sins, and interestingly, divorce was not made impossible on the grounds that to do so would only increase the instance of poisoning. We can also see the influence of the Greek East on Roman law. The patriarchal preference of the Romans was now diluted, as laws concerning family, inheritance, and marriage were all changed to improve the position of women, as well as that of freed slaves. It's possible that Theodora had some influence on these changes, 
and one can well imagine that she was in Justinian's thoughts when he approved the statement that mutual affection creates marriage rather than a dowry. Another modern innovation was Tribonian's suggestion that gospels be kept in courtrooms for the swearing of oaths. For contemporaries, the code certainly simplified legal procedures and became the basis of Byzantine law going forward. However, the code was written in Latin, and despite Trebonian's best efforts to simplify the language, the vast majority of those in the East spoke Greek. Latin was by now only the language of law once you moved east of Constantinople, and even most law students during this time would only learn passable Latin. So almost immediately, it was the Greek translations of the code, or even the Greek commentaries on it, which came into practical use. Justinian was aware of this issue, and during the rest of his reign, he legislated more often than not in Greek. A later collection of his laws, the novels, were written in Greek and were added to the code. The growing canon law of church courts was also written in Greek, and those out in the provinces would more often than not seek arbitration for their legal disputes with their local priest, who it was doubtful had ever read the code. However, if the code's immediate impact was less emphatic than we might expect, it would go on to have a surprising second life. Justinian's own attempts to restore the Roman Empire are not destined to succeed, but copies of the code will be issued to Italy soon enough. At some point during the 11th century, a huge portion of the code was found in a monastery in Pisa. It was taken to the great medieval university in Bologna, where it began to disseminate amongst interested scholars. Soon, both Western courts and the Catholic Church were mining the code for arguments to support their authority. The code provided a model for contracts, rules of procedure, family law, and wills that began to be given the force of law, initially spreading through the Italian city-states, where a written law was needed to govern increasingly complex commercial relationships, the use of the code then began to spread across the continent. At the heart of the code was a way to justify the divine right of kings, an important legal pillar for medieval royal families. The Roman and Byzantine emperors were, after all, autocrats. Tribonian's work had elaborated on the concept that the will of the prince has the force of law, to make sure that Justinian's authority was absolute. The emperor's insecurity and centralizing instincts had led him to make explicit the fact that any decision the emperor gave was to be considered legally binding. He justified it not only through his edited version of the Roman past, but also by the fact that he was appointed by God to protect his people. Centuries later, this handed the kings of Europe a way to legally establish their own rights. The legal thinking behind the code would even survive beyond the end of feudalism and serve as the backbone to the Napoleonic Code, the largest law reform of the modern age. Because Justinian's code presented a well-organized collection of laws covering almost every dispute imaginable, many of its principles were simply absorbed or built upon. The civil law tradition which flowed from this and which Napoleon and others codified is the basis of the majority of countries' legal systems today. It was very influential on the European continent. And then, of course, during the era of colonialism, those same principles were taken out to South America, Africa, and Asia. The defining principle of civil law was one established by Justinian's Code. In any dispute about law, the institution which drafted the statute prevails. In other words, the laws as laid down in a legal code is what will guide a judge's decision. In Britain and America, the tradition is different and is called common law. Here, the institution who interprets and adjudicates the statute has the final word. This gives precedence to case law. <laughs> 
decisions reached in the courtroom to help decide tricky arguments. So in a British or American court, a judge will decide the law and a jury will decide the facts. Whereas in a civil law court, the judge will decide everything, as indeed the arbiter would have done in Justinian's day. Justinian's legal works thus came closer to governing the world than even his wildest propaganda could have claimed. By condensing centuries of Roman law into one body that could be read and understood and which survived, the emperor and his quaestor left a sizable legacy for world civilization. When James Madison and his commission asked for a list of acquisitions for use by the First Continental Congress, the first thing he asked for was the Corpus Juris Civilis. Today, in the U.S. House of Representatives, 20 cameos hang on the walls representing the greatest lawgivers in history. And alongside images of Napoleon and Thomas Jefferson, Artrobonian and Justinian. Of course, I've just summarized centuries of history to try and give you a flavor of both the practical implications of Justinian's legal work and its influence on the future. There is, of course, so much more one could say and so much more to learn for those interested. The books which I've read to put together the podcast are listed at thehistoryofbyzantium.com the new URL, and on the post for this episode, I've also put up a link to where you can read an English translation of the code, complete with commentary. Justinian's other great legacy is perhaps easier to immediately grasp, largely because it still stands in Istanbul today. After the Nika revolt, downtown Constantinople was in ruins. The rebuilding work began immediately, and Justinian directed affairs. He rebuilt the Senate House on a smaller scale, and constructed new baths of Zeuxippus, with a mournful plaque describing the statues that had occupied its predecessor. The Church of Hagia Irene, the Hospice of Samson, and other public buildings, including the porticos of the Messi, were also reconstructed from the ground up. Justinian took the opportunity to add to the palace as well. The rebuilt Chalk Gate now led into a domed entranceway, on whose ceiling elaborate mosaics were created, showing Justinian and Theodora standing triumphant over the Vandals. Inside the palace, the emperor made sure that if he were ever besieged again, he would have the necessary supplies to survive, as he added an additional water supply, a bakery, and granary to the already massive complex. Building, as we've already seen, was something Justinian took a keen interest in. Churches were of particular interest because they combined the PR need to demonstrate imperial worthiness with his religious desire to honour his celestial benefactor. As I mentioned at the end of episode 20, only 40 days after the dust had settled on Nika, the ground was being prepared for a new cathedral church, a new Hagia Sophia, to rise up in the place of the one which had been destroyed. It seems obvious from this speed that Justinian had already been planning to construct a massive church in his capital, as no architects could have drawn up plans so quickly. Historians suspect that Justinian may have ordered plans to be drawn up back in 527, when he became emperor. For in that same year, the largest church in the capital at the time had just been completed. The church of St. Polyuctus, built near the aqueduct of Valens, was a construction ordered by Anitia Juliana. Anitia was the granddaughter of the emperor Valentinian III and daughter of Alibrius, who had briefly been Western emperor. Her impressive imperial pedigree made her a natural rival to Justinian, a man with no ancestors to speak of. Doubtless many of Anitia's friends were involved, or at least sympathetic, to the Nika revolts. Inside St. Polyuctus was a large inscription, comparing its sponsor to Constantine and Theodosius II, great builders and, of course, distant relatives 
The comparisons continued on to Solomon, the great Jewish king, whose famous temple was an inspiration to Christian church builders. Whether any part of Juliana's church was really intended as a dig at the peasant emperor, we don't know. Nor whether Justinian's new church was a riposte. It's not as if the emperor was shy about starting new projects. However, it's an interesting bit of context to Nika and to the new Hagia Sophia. Justinian's bold designs would have had to find a new spot in the city if the riots hadn't intervened. Now he could build a new church at the very centre of Constantinople. We should just pause for a word about the name Hagia Sophia. The church is not dedicated to any Saint Sophia, as many history books shorten it to. Instead, Hagia Sophia translates as Holy Wisdom. Wisdom was an important philosophical idea to Greek thinkers for centuries before Christianity. Many attempts were made to incorporate elements of Greek philosophy into the mystical traditions of Judaism, and one such effort saw the concept of wisdom as one of the ways God related to man. The wisdom of God had been linked to the word of God at the beginning of John's Gospel, where the word is that part of God that becomes flesh in the form of Jesus. Before we drift too far down any alleyways of theological speculation, just note that the full name of the church in Greek should read Shrine of the Holy Wisdom of God. The neighboring church of Hagia Irene was dedicated to God's holy peace. The shortening of the name comes from Sophia being the Latin phonetic spelling of the Greek word. Of course, in English, the name looks like it should be said Hagia Sophia. But we lack the soft G sound, which you would find in Greek, and we use the letter H, which they do not. In modern Greek, the pronunciation should be Aia Sophia. Thank you so much to all of you who pointed out the pronunciation issue, and particularly to listener Demetrios, whose help has been invaluable. I'm not entirely sure how the Byzantines would have pronounced it, and I don't want to confuse new listeners by attempting an accurate modern Greek translation all of the time, especially when I've been using a lot of anglicized and latinized names during this period. I'll see how I go, and certainly as the empire becomes more Greek, so will my pronunciations. The design of the new church was entrusted to two of the finest architects of the day, Anthemius of Trales and Isiodor of Miletus. Both were academic mathematicians and had written famous works on engineering, but neither was an experienced architect the way we would think of that profession today. Certainly they had never attempted a building on the scale that Justinian was envisioning. The emperor gave the two men carte blanche over the design and cost of the building on two conditions. The church should be of unparalleled magnificence, and it should be constructed in the shortest time possible. The emperor was already 50, and wanted to make sure he was still alive to see his most important construction. Christian churches of the time tended to adopt one of two styles. Those in the west were built in the shape of basilicas, Originally a public building, and then increasingly a feature of palaces, a basilica would generally have a central aisle, or nave, leading to an apse at one end. The building suited the Christian service, with a priest at the front, and congregations sitting in the nave, or side aisles. In the east, an alternative style had developed, which allowed the congregation to sit in the round sometimes because the church was built around a shrine or the tomb of a martyr. The decision was taken to allow the new church to accommodate both styles of worship. Politically, it was valuable to have both because it meant that important citizens could be seated in a circle where they could witness the emperor at worship. However, by also having a long central aisle, the liturgical need for regular processions could be accommodated. To accomplish this, Anthemius and Isidore decided to build a huge dome, the largest anyone had ever seen, which would cover the basilica shape and allow in adequate light. Roman architects had created domed buildings before, of course, such as the Pantheon, but those domes were built on circular buildings, 
to accommodate the huge dome over a rectangular shape, an architectural innovation was needed. This was the pendentive, an inverted triangle which could carry the weight of the dome above by transferring all the strain into their thin bottom point, which could then be placed on top of sturdy piers below. With two semi-domes, arches and buttresses holding the dome in place, those piers would need to be pretty sturdy. Although Anthemius and Isidore did their best, there were problems. In their rush to meet Justinian's schedule, they didn't allow sufficient time for the mortar to set around the giant piers that they had sunk into the city's bedrock. Three years into the project, the piers began to give way. The architects scrambled to secure their construction, changing the shape of their arches and adding stone projections to help strengthen the building. And although this worked for 20 years, by 558, the structural weaknesses would tell, and the dome collapsed. Isidore the Younger, either the nephew or son of the original architect, would raise the dome by about 20 feet to its current height. Back in the 530s, though, and the whole empire was raided for the materials needed to decorate the interior. 10,000 labourers worked every day to bring in the marble and porphyry which would provide floor, wall and column of different colours and hues. The interior of the dome and ceiling were to be coloured gold, along with decorative patterns of red, blue and green. There were no figurative mosaics, which most churches would have been adorned with. Instead, there were endlessly repeated images of the cross amongst the gold. This may have been a practical decision to speed the building process, or because the surfaces were too high for mosaics to be seen. As Procopius discovered, the effect was that the eye sweeps around the whole of the interior rather than focusing on one area, as figurative images would encourage. At the base of the dome were 40 windows, giving the dome the appearance of being suspended from heaven by a golden chain. The light would then flow in, illuminating the gold and bouncing down to the coloured surfaces below. The light would also bounce off the chain suspended from the gold, which held thousands of lamps and candelabra for evening services. The decorations were elaborate too, of course. A 50-foot iconstasis made of silver, a high altar encrusted with gold and precious stones. The patriarch's throne was made of gilded silver, and dozens of gold lamps surrounded the building. Estimates suggest that Justinian lavished £320,000 of gold on the church. And whatever we might think of that amount, Justinian got exactly what he wanted. It took 35 years to build St Paul's Cathedral in London with near-modern engineering methods. The Hagia Sophia was ready for its inauguration only five years, ten months, and four days after construction had begun. An extraordinary speed. On December 27th, 537, Manus the Patriarch and Justinian led a procession down the Messi to hold the first service. Although he probably didn't say it, the sentiment seems apt as Justinian viewed his creation and uttered the words, Solomon, I have outdone you. The emperor was not the only one blown away by the church. The architectural genius astounded contemporaries. Evagrius, an ecclesiastical historian, said it was incomparable and surpassed all powers of description. Paul the Silentiary, who worked for Justinian, said the golden stream of glittering rays pours down and strikes the eyes of men so that they can scarcely bear to look at it. It is as if one were to gaze upon the midday sun in spring. Procopius describes the building as seeming to soar up to heaven and rise above surrounding buildings like a huge ship anchored among them. It's important to remember that for contemporaries, it was easily the largest building they had ever seen. For someone who didn't live in Constantinople and wasn't used to big structures at all, the sight would have been overwhelming. It would be the largest Christian church in the world for a thousand years, 
even with modern construction, it still sits in the top 20. It certainly served as an inspiration for those which have surpassed it, including St. Paul's in London and St. Peter's in Rome. It's hard to quantify the importance of the Hagia Sophia to Byzantium. It is only a building, and its effects on human psychology cannot be judged by numbers or some other measurable criteria. Certainly the emperors would not have been able to boast as convincingly that they were God's vice-regent on earth without a building to honor him that no other kingdom could match. As the tide of Islam swept the east and western kingdoms would grow in prominence, visitors from all corners of the globe would still marvel at the site of Constantinople's most impressive building. To its citizens it became a focal point of worship and celebration, and the admiration of the Byzantines never wavered. Germanos, a patriarch from the 8th century, said the church is an earthly heaven where the super-celestial god dwells and walks about. A century later, and another patriarch, Photios, calls the church Christ's bride. Even the final patriarch in residence before the city fell in 1453 calls it the handiwork of God, a marvelous and worthy work, the delight of the entire earth. To medieval visitors, it was such an awesome spectacle that legends grew up to explain its construction, such as how angels aided the builders, or the wood from Noah's Ark was needed for the doors. In celebrated legend, the Ahir Sophia would later so impress Russian envoys that they convinced their king to adopt the Orthodox Christian faith. Justinian couldn't have asked for more of his architects than the creation of such an enduring monument. Yet despite the building's unqualified magnificence, there were visible mistakes. Unpolished stone faces, slabs of marble simply butted together rather than assembled with meated edges, the dome that would collapse. One of Justinian's modern biographers, James Evans, says that the building puts Justinian's personality flaws on record. Impatient and eager that his church should exhibit his worthiness as God's emperor, he refused the builders time for their mortar to set properly, contributing to the structure's instability. An analogy for his emperorship, perhaps? Today we heard about the two achievements which outlasted the Byzantine Empire, let alone Justinian's life. Next time, we move on to projects that didn't fare as well. In two weeks, Belisarius is out on the road again, as Justinian looks to add to his conquest of Africa by restoring Italy to the Empire. After all, what is the Roman Empire without Rome?